Todd and I have been friends for a long time. Recently, we were together up at Frank's in Ashland, Frank Tate's. We were at the motel together. We got on the elevator together, and some fella got on the elevator with us, and he goes, father and son? <laughs> and um, neither one of us asked him which one he thought was. <laughs> But I, I give Todd credit, he, he did step up and he said, yeah, I'm the father. <laughs> and uh, then, then later on, he said, uh, you know that he thought you were the father. <laughs> and thus is our relationship. <laughs> what an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you for asking me. And I've been like these other men have said so encouraged by the message has been such a comfort to me such a we 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 love to hear good preaching preachers do and thankful for times like these where we can my text this morning is found in the book of Joshua chapter 6 if you would turn there with me and let me say while you're turning by God's grace I'm learning to rest that uh, seems to be, of course, Christ is the theme in our preaching, but that kind of seems to be the, the ongoing theme in preaching Christ is his finished work and us resting in his finished work. You know, I love to take an afternoon nap, but that's not the kind of rest that I'm talking about. Resting in Christ. And I want to encourage you to continue to rest in Christ. Moses wrote in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from the work which he had made. God rested. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. He set it apart. He made it holy because that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, when can a man and woman truly rest? When their work is finished. When their work is finished. I can rest in Christ because he has finished the work. He finished it. Well, what is there for me to do? What must I do to be saved? And as we've so well heard, nothing. We can do nothing. I can rest in Christ. That was his last words to his people on the cross. He said, it's finished. And friends, it was. And we can rest. The whole will of God is finished. The work God gave Christ to do is complete. Perfect obedience to the law of God has been accomplished a perfect righteousness for his elect is performed. Eternal salvation for his people is executed. Complete pardon is procured and concluded and redemption from the curse of the law has been made. Justice has been satisfied. God no longer angry with the wicked every day. Full atonement made, iniquities vanished, peace is acquired, rest is given, and it's finished. Are you resting? Oh, may God enable us to rest. I'm learning to rest. So why don't we? Why, why do we find so much unrest still? Well, it's because we, we still have just too much unbelief in us. God, help us to believe. Lord, I believe. Help out my unbelief. Most everyone knows the story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho. Most of us as children sung that little song. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. But you know, I was thinking from a doctrinal standpoint, that's not right. Uh, it was the Lord who fought the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. It's the Lord who's fought all our battles for us. Every single one of them. 
It's the Lord who will continue to fight all our battles. And isn't that so comforting to know that he is fighting our battles? Knowing that the war is over, it's finished in Christ. And I'm learning to rest in peace and with assurance in that wondrous gospel fact. Christ did for me what I could not do for myself, and it's finished, and I can rest. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 30, Moses told Israel, The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bare, that word means pardon and forgive. He, he bare, he pardoned, he forgave you as a man doth bear or forgive his son. And all the way that he went until you came into this place. And when Israel, remember when they faced those two evil kings, Sihon and Og, Moses told them in Deuteronomy 3 verse 22, you shall not fear them. No, you shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. We don't fight our own battles, friends. The Lord does. And the next time you're in a battle, remember that and rest. The Lord thy God is with thee, for the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Deuteronomy 20, verse 4. Will we ever learn? There's no war for us to fight. If onward Christian soldiers, well, I, I know what they're saying, but no, nah, <laughs> the war's over. It's finished, and Jesus Christ is Lord. Our captain, the captain of the host of the Lord, that's who he is. He's the Lord of lords. He's the king of kings. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could think or ask. Abundantly is, oh, that's wonderful, but exceeding abundantly? Ah. Now, I can think and ask some pretty high things, but he can do much more and much higher. His promise is sure because of who he is. It's God who makes us this promise. He is faithful that promised. He's God. He's faithful that promised. Sometimes we promise things beyond our ability to do, but our Lord is able to do anything and everything. That's what he told Abraham. Is there anything too hard for me? Yeah, I know you're 100 and I know your wife's 90, but you're going to have a child. Now, nothing too hard for me. Nothing. Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. Well, that was because of the Lord of the children of Israel. Remember what Rahab said? She said, oh, we've heard about your Lord. We've heard what he did in Egypt. We heard what he did at the Red Sea. We've heard about him. And our hearts didn't matter. Israel, Jericho was shut up. None went in and none came out. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given you. The Lord gave those things. We see that Jericho was shut up. They were prisoners behind their own walls. God made Jericho a captive audience as to what he was going to do over the next seven days. But notice that it was the Lord who had given Israel the victory. The Lord is the one that fights for us. In verse 2, we see that God gave him three things. Joshua gave him three things. Jericho itself, the king of Jericho, and the mighty men of valor in Jericho. Salvation and deliverance is the gift of God. God gives this gift. And that's why the child of God can rest. Are you resting? Are you resting in your great Joshua? 
God has put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Nothing. What does that mean? Everything? It's nothing. It means everything, yes. Read on verse 3. And ye shall compass or circle the city, all ye men of war, and go around about the city once. Thou shalt... Thou sh thus shalt thou do six days, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. What a clear picture we have that salvation is of the Lord. And a believing sinner can rest in but here we also see that God very often uses men and women as the means to accomplish his sovereign will and purpose. Sometimes God does the miraculous to accomplish his will, but in many cases, God accomplishes his will and his purpose through the service and obedience of his people. And when we've done all that we're required to do, we're nothing but unprofitable servants. But Noah built the ark, and Moses delivered God's people out of Egypt, and Samson defeated Israel's enemies, and David slew Goliath, and Solomon built the temple, and Joseph saved Israel in time of famine, and God's people through faith subdued kingdoms and wrought righteousness and obtained promises that stopped the mouths of lions. Quench the balance of fire, turn to flight the armies of aliens, receive their dead to life again. And it was all through faith in God Almighty, and it was God who was behind it all. And he gets all the glory, and we rest in that. Here the Lord instructs Joshua as to how he himself would bring down the city of Jericho, and when God has finished all of Israel and everyone in it, is going to know that they didn't have anything to do with it. The child of God would tell you quick, every believer, I didn't have any doing in it. None. What a distinct picture here we have of the Lord's great commission to his people to go into all the world and preach the gospel. The outcome of God's will and purpose is never, ever a matter of speculation. The gospel through preaching of the word of God will always find success in the hearts of God's chosen because God is going to see to it. God has ordained preaching as the means of his word being spread. The success of the gospel is certain. Certain. I love what the Lord says in Isaiah chapter 55. He, first he says God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Our ways are not God's way. His thoughts and his ways are higher than ours as the heavens are higher than the earth. And then God says, so shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. It shall not. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. That sounds like a success story to me. God declares, is not my word like as a fire and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Oh, it sure broke this hard heart of mine. God gave Joshua Jericho because it was God who gave it. Jericho was defeated before the battle ever began. So is every battle of ours. If God give us eyes to see. Every battle already won. The king, representative of this world's government, the king of Jericho, was also a designated target for defeat. God said, I give you their king. I'm not, I give you the land. I give you their king. Well, friends, is not the king's heart in the hand of the Lord? As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. 
Nations and their kings are no match for God. No match for his gospel. For the Lord has spoken. I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom. And he did. Ethiopia and Seba for thee, since thou was precious in my sight. Every time I read that, I think, me? Yes. In Christ, I'm precious in his sight. You are precious in my sight. Thou hast been honorable. Me? Yes, you. And I've loved thee. Me? Loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, I will give men for thee and people for thy life. Wow. Jericho's men of valor very well represent today's organized religion, I believe, who are in reality enemies of the gospel. And they, too, ordained to defeat. Many of us were saved out of religion. God will see to it that the gospel will find all of his people. And I said it that way on purpose. We don't find the gospel. The gospel finds us, doesn't it? We preach the gospel boldly because we're certain of the outcome. We know how this ends. We preach the gospel knowing that God is faithful that promise God's word will accomplish that which he sent it to accomplish. It cannot return void. It cannot. It's impossible to return void. Why? Because he said so. It shall accomplish. It shall not return unto me void. Oh, how I wish we could learn this, especially us preachers. You know, the results of our preaching are really not our concern. But we, we think about it so much. We all do. Let's confess that we do. We, 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 we're just, by nature, we want to see results, don't we? And we often get discouraged when we don't see results. And religion today, well, that's, what, that's all they're about. They're all about the numbers and how many. But the people of God know that the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. This is the Lord's business. We plant, we water, but it's God that gives the increase. How many is not our concern? That's God's business. You know, I was raised in a church, Southern Baptist. I'll go ahead and tell you, you'd figure it out anyway after I tell you. <laughs> well, they had that plaque on the wall. You remember those? They changed them every week. I guess they had somebody that that was their ministry. <laughs> you know, count and post on the plaque. They were consumed with numbers. They posted them. How many were in Sunday school? How many were in church service? How many were visitors? How many were saved? Oh, that was always a, a number they were trying to get pushed up. God despises such nonsense. Why? Because that's God's business. And I know this much. How many is how many he determines. And it's no concern of ours. The Lord has called us to preach. And the results is his business. God told David not to take a census, but David took one anyway. And he did so, when you get really right down to it, he did so because he was proud of all his accomplishments. And the Lord was so displeased that he gave David three options of punishment, seven years of famine, being chased three months by their enemies, or pestilence in the land, and uh, David chose pestilence, and 70,000 men died. And more would have died, the scripture says, had the Lord not said to the angel, stay your hand. How serious is this? Very serious, very serious. My, my, our concern is to preach and to plant and water, and we must plant and water. And last night, Gabe planted and Chris watered, and Marvin just planted, and I'm trying to water. But it's God that gives the increase. You know, evangelism today has become all about the numbers and how many. The first question that I'm asked when somebody finds out that I'm a pastor, you are shaking your head, you, you know too. How big a church do you have? How many members? That's God's business. One of these days, I'm going to say, none of your business. Because <laughs> it's God's business. 
You see, the message of the gospel is no longer the issue. And, and any and every means is used to add the numbers. Entertainment has replaced gospel preaching. Show business has entered into the church and replaced worship. Giving money has replaced giving praise to Christ and him alone. You know it and I know it. It's sad. It's, the preaching of the gospel is not to answer men and women's never-ending debating questions. Personally, I don't care where Cain's wife came from. I don't. I'm not going to debate it. I, I just, it's not the issue. Preaching the gospel is to, to declare the sure, complete salvation that Christ accomplished. Salvation is accomplished by the shedding of Christ's blood. Tell me about that. Tell me the story of Jesus. Tell me again and again how God saved wretched sinners like me. That's what I want to hear. We know that God's the only one who can divinely intervene in our lives. We know that God is the only one who can divinely reveal the glorious truth of Christ in him crucified. And he does so through preaching. That's why we're here. Oh, we love conferences. We do. I've had so many people say, man, this is just wonderful. And it is. But why are we here? To hear the message of Jesus Christ in him crucified. To hear what we heard last night on what it is to be saved, as you so ably did. Yes, faith in Christ is a predetermined thing. And the gospel will cross the path of every believer. And God's elect will hear the gospel. And God's elect will be given faith to believe. And somebody once said, the same heat that melts the ice also hardens the clay. And yes, that's true. But the son of righteousness is the only one who can determine the outcome. And it's God who melts hearts and it's God who hardens them. But that doesn't change the means. So we keep on preaching. He pleased God by what the world calls foolishness to save them that believe. And that foolishness they say is preaching. But to the child of God, it's the power of God unto salvation. That's it's the most important thing in the world. Beginning next week in Madisonville, Kentucky, there's a big religious crusade coming to town. For months now, there have been signs in people's yards and in front of businesses everywhere. And it simply says, go tell America. My question is, what, what are you going to tell them? What are you going to tell them? I'd like to know. Uh, I, I got an email from this organization. I, let me just read the... the it was very short and brief. It said, uh, Pastor Edmondson, I wanted to reach out to you in regards to the Go Tell Crusades coming to our city. This crusade is modeled after the Billy Graham Crusades. Well, that'd be enough right there for me to not be involved in. <laughs> From years past, we now have 40 plus churches linking arms together to reach our community with the good news. Please join us in this combined effort. And the first thing I'll say concerning this is what they call good news is not the same good news that you and I believe and preach. It's just not. So what are they going to go tell? Not good news at all to me. Their good news is uncertain at best. Are they going to tell sinners that God wants to save them if the sinner will let them? That's not my God. Are they going to go tell uh, that God will save you if you let Jesus into your heart? Are they going to tell if you make Jesus Lord, if you let go and let God, or if you believe God made salvation possible, that he'll save you? Well, that's not good news for me. You know why? Because by nature and with my wretched heart, I will not. I won't. That's not good news. I need somebody to bust the door down. I need somebody to divinely intervene. I need a divine intervention from God Almighty. We cannot come, we will not come, and we will not believe that we might have life. We can't link arms together. Their God's nothing like our God. And you can call me closed-minded, and you can call me dogmatic, and you can call me unevangelical, but God honors the truth, friends. 
those that worship him do so in spirit and in truth. Religion seeks visible and recordable results. They've invented ways by which they can keep score. That's all it is. The invitation system. Somebody called it decisional regeneration. Well, that's about all it is. Was invented so that false religion could show and prove that their existence was credible. The church altar was invented to induce men and women to follow the crowd, to fit in and to go along. You don't find anywhere in the scriptures about altar calls and people moving from one place in the church to another and call that salvation. We've come to God in our hearts without moving a muscle. I tell men, come to Christ and don't move a muscle. And God and his people despise these things. Why? Because they promote sight and not faith. Now, I know something about this. I was raised in such a religion. It promotes man's power, not God's. It promotes man's will, not God's. It promotes man's decision, not God's. It promotes man's righteousness, not God's. Somebody asked me not long ago, said, well, you don't believe a, a decision involved in salvation? I said, oh, yeah. But it was made before the foundation of the world by God and not me. Our text puts this illegitimate notion to rest. Everything about God's commission to Israel reveals what it is to declare the gospel. Let me give it to you as quickly as I can. The first evident thing to me here is that the preaching of the gospel is repetitive. Faith comes by hearing, continually hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and not just any kind of hearing, true hearing. The hearing of truth by the word. Thy word is truth. Uh, I, I, uh, I have a, a man in our church who's a contractor, and he works in surrounding care, uh, areas. And I have a cousin who lives in one of those counties, and she's a real estate agent. So he's worked with her for time again, time and time again. She knows that I'm a pastor. So she saw him one week and said, oh, he said, what did David Lee preach last week? That, that's what my family called me, David Lee. Don't you call me that. <laughs> but see, what did David Lee preached last week? And he goes, the same thing he preaches every week. And she, he said, she looked at him funny. And she said, pardon me? And she said, the same thing he preaches every Sunday and every Wednesday. And you know what she said? I'm sure sorry. <laughs> they don't have an idea what we're talking about. Our message is the same, isn't it? He preached... The same message he preached last night from a different text. Oftentimes when we're preaching on a, a passage of scripture, you know, we'll get online and I'll listen to Todd or Chris or Gabe or Donnie or any of these men, Greg, and uh, it's the same message. Christ and him crucified. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, Israel was to march around the city for six days straight. This was hardly the practice of making war. They didn't make any contact with the enemy. <laughs> they didn't hand out gospel tracts. They didn't witness on the street corners. They didn't stick signs in people's yards. <laughs> they marched around the city in silence with the exception of one thing, the blowing of the ram's horn. Did you hear me? Some of you shaking your head, you know what that represents. It represents the preaching of the gospel. This is the one thing that we must do, preach the gospel. It's the means that God uses to save sinners. The blowing of the gospel horn took preeminence. And friends, it must. It must. This is the very thing that's missing in religion today. The preaching of the gospel, the very means that God uses to save Everyone in Jericho, now you try to imagine, everyone in Jericho, when they heard that ram's horn, you know they were scared of that, out of their mind. What does that mean? Well, we know what God, their God did to their enemies, and what, what are they doing? Peep out of the window there. Oh, they're just walking around the city, and then that ram horn blows. Well, what's that? They scared out of their mind when they heard it. But there was a harlot. 
living in that city that rejoiced when she heard it. It was a single note of the gospel of Christ that her Joshua had come to save her. Each day she awoke to the sound of the ram's horn, and each night she laid her head down on that pillow uh, with confidence and full assurance that salvation and deliverance would soon be hers. The ram's horn struck terror in the hearts of all those in the city had heard it. Why? Because they didn't know what it meant. But Rahab knew. You see, she was looking out the window, and all she could see was a scarlet cord hanging there. The sound of that one note was the sweetest sound she ever heard. My Joshua is coming. He's coming to, to save me. He's coming to redeem me. He's coming to make me his own. Though the walls had not yet fallen, though she had not yet been delivered, her salvation was as sure on the first day as it was on the last. We don't know anything about the preparatory work that God does before a sinner effectually hears the gospel. Some call it prevenient grace. I don't know. But I know that we cannot see men and women hearing the gospel. Our responsibility is not to tear down the walls and our responsibility is not to sneak into the city and rescue the fallen and we don't unlock the prison doors and release the prisoner. That's God's work. Just like you said last night, God sent an earthquake and all them doors opened. He don't need our help. Going to help God save sinners? No, I don't think so. We need to be saved ourselves. It's all God's work. Then what are we to do? We keep on marching. Keep on marching. We keep on blowing the trumpet. We keep on going forth and preaching the gospel if we know that the victory is the Lord's. And in God's good time, the walls will come tumbling down. The elect will be rescued. God's enemies will be destroyed. And all the glory will go to God. All of it. Now, quickly, let me just tell you a, a little more about the instruments of war used. The primary instruments here was the Ark of the Covenant. You know what that pictures. It was carried upon the shoulders of the priest. What a picture of Christ going before us as we lift him up in preaching. In preaching, we declare his perfection, as Todd said in his prayer earlier. That's the difference, for it must be perfect to be accepted. Christ is our perfection. Christ is our acceptance. We're accepted in the beloved. Our perfect Savior did a perfect work. He provided a perfect sacrifice. He worked a, and wrought a perfect righteousness for his imperfect people. Verse 4, we're told there were seven priests, seven horns, and it was on the seventh day. As you know, seven is the number of completion. Friends, it's finished. We have a perfect result here. The other instruments of war, the horn, as we've already talked about, and on the last day, the shout. You know, I got to thinking about that. Both were delivered by noise. And sometimes that's all preachers are, just noise. But we're also voices crying in the wilderness. The voice of the trumpet, the voice of a man, just one note. It's the same note over and over. And somebody might say, well, that don't make much a song. Well, the song that, that we preach is beautiful. And we love the fact that it's one note. And friends, it's the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and He plants it into the seeds of the hearts of His people and God causes that seed, the seed that God's servants plant in water to give increase. And it's then that the child of God is born again. The walls come tumbling down. The hard walls of our, high walls of our hearts. And we are made new creatures and new creations in Christ. And you know, I found it very interesting that the ram's horn in the original language doesn't just mean the horn, but it also means the sound that it makes. The phrase comes from that word jubilee. It's not just preaching that's a. It's the sound. It's the message of the preacher. Paul didn't say, woe unto me if I preach not. He said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. A lot of preaching being done today, but it's not true preaching. 
Oh my, the Lord that the priest blew was the same horn that was used to begin the year of Jubilee. And at the sound of that ram's horn with that singular bright note and sound meant that the slave was now set free and that the debtor was now forgiven and all that was lost was now returned. That's good news. Christ is our Jubilee. Let's blow that horn. Men and women say they believe the salvations of the Lord, but really most don't. Because they want to add a work of their own righteousness is the first sign that's not so. In verse 2, God said, I have given unto thy hand. In verse 5, God said, and it shall come to pass. And it was God that did everything in between those verses. Salvation is of the Lord. And it's finished. And we can rest in that. You know, I'll leave you with this. When God was finished with Jericho. Every man, woman, boy, girl, and small child in Israel knew that they didn't have anything to do with it. Nothing. God is not dependent on anyone or anything to accomplish his divine purpose. The only requirement for us is to trust and obey. That's exactly what faith is. It's trusting and obeying. It's proving our faith by our works. We're not saved by our works. Our works prove that we have faith. Faith without works is dead being alone. And yes, that faith is God's gift to us. He gets all the glory, even through the grace and the faith that he so freely bestows upon us. We prove that we believe by doing what God says, and we plant, and we water, and we water, and we plant, and we plant, and we water, and we wait. And if God is pleased to give the increase, he gives it. And it's a success story. This is a successful gospel that we preach. And do it again today and do it tomorrow and do it the next day. Do it every day afterwards. March and march again. Blow that single trumpet of the gospel over and over. And the wall of some sinner's heart will come tumbling down. God said no weapons formed against you shall prosper. But the weapons we have are not carnal. They're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. God saves sinners by the preaching of the gospel. And that's what we're going to do, isn't it? It's finished. God says, I'm satisfied. And we see that God has given all things to Christ. Christ gives the increase. Christ is the increase. Salvation's the gift of God. Christ is salvation. And that's where the sinner rests. Christ is the only place to rest. No other place. May God be pleased to make it so for his glory, our good, and for Christ's sake.